Brilliant. Um, yeah, well, th thank you, Tony. And um, thanks to the Best Chefs UK for uh, letting me speak at your conference. I've been um, listening in and, um, you know, inspired by all that's going on and the fundraising from the patient community um, is, uh, you know, is really impressive. So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, as Tony mentioned, I'm a GP, um, but I've had quite a long interest in rare and genetic diseases um, from a primary care point of view. Um, the background to that is uh, my eldest son has a lysosomal storage disorder called Neiman Pick Type C. It's an ultra rare disease uh, affecting um, about one in a hundred thousand people. Um, and, and that's kind of why I kind of found myself both uh, obviously because Sam was affected, but also professionally steering into this. Um, I now also, in, in addition to being a GP in, in West Yorkshire, I have a research position at the University of Nottingham, um, looking at how we can use the electronic health record to recognize rare disease patients, uh, and also kind of some more broad predict predictive tools for other diseases, as well as kind of the mainstream of genomic technologies. Um, and more recently in the last several months, I've been working with Mendelian. Uh, so anyone who saw the lunchtime meeting, I would have heard from um, during the lunchtime, the video over lunch, would have heard from Rudy uh, and I'm now the clinical lead of Mendelian. So <clears throat> this is this is kind of a combination talk. Um, so I'm kind of combining a talk that I've given before about rare diseases and primary care, uh, along with a bit more detail about Mendelian, um, uh, our project called Mendelscan, and also um, Mendelscan uh, and Beshet's disease, some information um, that's kind of fairly hot off the press from what we're doing with Mendelscan. So I understand this is a fairly international audience, but even if it's not, it's really worth emphasizing what primary care is and certainly UK primary care. Um, so GPs and primary care more generally, um, we're generalists um, and there aren't very many of those left. Um, so family-centered care and truly from cradle to grave. So in a single clinic or surgery, I can see people in their first year of life right through to their 10th decade. Um, and we manage acute disease, chronic disease, and also health prevention. And I think often talked about being the gatekeepers of the NHS. I think professionally, we often think part of our role is also to protect our patients from over investigation and over medicalization. And something which I think is uh, a really valuable part, we're quite comfortable with uncertainty and using time both as an investigation and as an, as an intervention. Um, we're used to managing uncertainty uh, and this concept of the kind of biological, psychological and social model of, of medicine, uh, I think is intrinsic to what good primary care is. I think our kind of specialist um, test or specialist procedure that we do is our consultation. So um, there's lots of work looking at how that consultation can be conducted and modeled to get the maximum outcome from it. Then the other thing about primary care is there's lots of us. There's 42,000 GPs. Um, so when people say, oh, GPs aren't any good at that, I often say, well, it's like saying, you know, a person from somewhere of, uh, of a medium-sized town is, you're implying that the whole town is not very good at something. There's, over, there's more than 7,500 GP practices, uh, and there are a million patient contacts per day. And indeed, 90% of all patient contacts happen in the NHS. Um, so to, to develop any form of criteria, any form of suspicion criteria, or any form of care pathway that doesn't involve what actually constitutes 90% of NHS care um, doesn't really make sense. It receives only a tiny, a, a small fraction of the NHS budget. And actually, that does equate to approximately £136 per patient per year, which is less than the pet insurance for my cat. Um, now, there are an average of six consultations per year. Um, and that demand is increasing. And indeed, six cons consultations is double what it was 10 years ago. Uh, I think it's important to kind of emphasize these things because anything that you're going to try and introduce to primary care, you need to be very sensitive to what is often quite a struggling service. So when I talk about rare diseases in primary care to uh, different audiences, I often start with a few kind of statements and I'm gonna concentrate on diagnosis and not talk about management so much, uh, just in, in the interest of time. But I think one of the things which we, which is often said, is we don't see rare diseases in primary care, they're all seen in hospitals. And I think 
this is a, a, an audience that's very familiar and will be very aware of this, but emphasizing that collectively rare diseases are not rare. In a typical surgery of 8,000 patients, this equates to 470 patients, now that one in 17 lifetime instance of a rare disease. Um, and often they're typically serious diseases and can quite frequently be life limiting. And the large majority of them have a genetic basis. Um, and indeed, many of these have its symptom onset in childhood. You know, and emphasizing that the, you know, this infographic I've taken, which has been um, given to me by medics for rare disease, you know, their emblem is a zebra. So that, that adage in medicine, if you hear who beats, don't expect to see a zebra, is unhelpful for the rare disease community. So then the next um, kind of question or statement that I then challenge when I'm talking about diagnosis in primary care is, you know, we diagnose the bread and butter conditions. These rarities are the realm of the geneticists and the neurologists, and perhaps also in, in this context, the rheumatologists and dermatologists. But one of the things which I think is frequently commented on, you know, and, I, and I've already seen from the questions being posed in the chat um, function here, is this idea of the diagnostic odyssey. And people talk about medical ping pong, bouncing around different departments, back to primary care, another test, to the rheumatologist, back to primary care, to the dermatologist, back to primary. Um, and actual fact, you know, that is a well-established feature across rare diseases. Um, and that ability to identify patterns frequently missed by secondary care, I think can happen in primary care, linking the dots. You know, we have this continuity of record, primary care electronic health record, has been established for almost 30 years in some places. And it, and it truly is, it, it's at least a decade ahead of secondary care. Um, and those clinical features spread across both organ system, specialties, and time um, can all, or are all brought together in that primary care electronic health record. I think GPs also, as I've already talked about, have skills in managing uncertainty and excluding the rare amounts of common. So I emphasize this when I talk to other GPs. You know, we spend a lot of our time excluding things which, although may not be defined as a rare disease, are rare for an individual GP. Um, you know, lots of cancers, significant infections in children. Um, it obviously comes in the news when they, you know there's significant sepsis in young children and they have awful outcomes. And um, but they are the tiny tip of what is an otherwise huge self-limiting viral illness iceberg. Um, and we spend our time both thinking, have they got that, and excluding it and documenting why we've excluded it. So this idea of rare diseases in primary care, we do this all the time. I then often pause, you know, I suggest some other kind of areas where people can look, you know, revisiting inadequate historical diagnoses. Is there a more plausible explanation? I think as a kind of a, as a, an aside, I'll, I'll mention actually, part of how I started chatting to Rudy was we were both presenting at the same meeting um, and I'd actually used the Mendel app that um, Rudy was demonstrating in the video and I'd use that having seen a seen a patient who was in their early 20s who had come from um, who was a refugee in this country and had a had a diagnosis of epilepsy learning disabilities but also had been under the endocrinologist with a low calcium uh, um, caused by a thing called hyperparathyroidism and that just seemed a somewhat implausible combination of things. And indeed, the mum's explanation for her child having a learning disability and epilepsy was that when, when they were back in there, before they'd come to the UK, their child had been dropped as a, as a young child on her head and had, a, had had a traumatic brain injury. Um, and this patient, when they'd arrived in the UK in their, in their mid-teens, had, had seen a neurologist, had seen an endocrinologist, but no one, there was no comment in the letters that there was any pertinence between the two and simply thinking that's not likely putting into a search tool came up with a, a list of differentials and indeed that patient was referred off to clinical genetics and had subsequent testing so i think the other thing i often say is don't mistake a clinical description of symptoms as a diagnosis um and you know i think you know i've just touched on one there epilepsy can be a primary diagnosis but it can also have other causes so it can have an underlying cause an etiology a for that and learning disability is another one and i think one of the key things as well is then also no one can know seven thousand diseases that's okay sometimes that's about being too 
het up about knowing the details of each individual diseases is counterproductive. It's about emphasizing this is a big public health need, that's an unmet need, where there are thousands of patients having a long protracted diagnostic odyssey across a range of diseases is a more important message. Making use of gut feeling, you know, when it doesn't fit with normal pattern recognition, and there's quite good evidence that experienced clinicians are good at this. And then, as already been touched on, using some of these problem-based searches for differential diagnoses. Um, there's Mendelap, but there are other ones as well. And then emphasizing benefits even in the absence of disease-specific therapies. And I'm sure the community listening to this will know very well what I'm talking about, and absolutely for the community that I'm the chairman of and that my son has. Um, that's so very, very true. Having the diagnostic label gives you um, a, a uh, improves the narrative of why you've got the problems you've got. It, it enables you to access expert care, access, uh, access clinical trials. But even if we talk about things like cystic fibrosis, you know, there is no disease modifying therapy for that. But for every year since the mid 1970s, life expectancy for children diagnosed with cystic fibrosis has increased by six months. And that's just by better routine care. So now moving kind of on to the next bit, well, what, what about the future of rare disease diagnosis in primary care? And I think undoubtedly clinical decision support systems embedded in the electronic health record will improve diagnoses. Um, and now I'll just move on to talking a little bit about Mendel scan. Um, so this has already been touched on by Rudy in the lunchtime video. Um, and it will be very familiar. But this idea that rare disease diagnosis is broken, this long diagnostic odyssey, these misdiagnoses, and this medical ping pong around the healthcare system. Um, but rare diseases are hard to diagnose. They're diverse, they're varied, they often progress gradually over time and they change their appearance over time as a disease progresses and as the different phases of a disease occur. They're often multi systemic, referral to different specialists. Um, and complex pattern recognition is required. So one of the, um, uh, in the lunchtime video, um, Rudy was talking about uh, Mendelap, which I've touched on already in, in my talk. But we have a, another project, which is a little bit different. So Mendelap is one where you have to be actively thinking, hang on, could this person have, a, have a, another reason for their problems? Mendel scan is a kind of a more democratic approach is actually saying, well, you don't need to be raising this as a possibility. How about the electronic health record does some of the work for you? Um, so the way this the way this works, and you should be able to see by the slide is that we, we engage with a GP network and that at a, at a population level. Through a range of agreements, we get a pseudonymized data access provided under a data sharing agreement and we receive that data. Now this is data, this is what we call structured data. So this is coded data using coding nomenclature. So when you see your GP um, or indeed in the hospital, but if we talk about primary care, let's say you go along to see your GP and you go in and you, you, you go with a respiratory infection. Your GP will ask you a load of questions. They'll type some things into your record, the story, and none of that will be structured. They then may put a diagnosis for that consultation. They might check your blood pressure and pulse. That may also be recorded. And then they'll prescribe you something. And again, that would also be recorded in a structured way. So we get access to that structured data, not to any of the free text, um, but to that data. And then what Mendelian have done is they've taken already existing disease specific diagnostic criteria or suspicion criteria. Um, and they have, and we've digitalized those. So we've converted those into the terms that they would exist within the electronic health record system as coded terms. And then we apply these criteria, these algorithms at scale across a whole population and identify patients that breach these criteria. This is for a range of different diseases. And then these criteria can then be fed back in um, the, the identified patients by each criteria, a report is generated with the name of the disease the, the features in their electronic health record that made us think they might have this disease, and then suggested next steps. Um, and that's returned back to the patient's GP to review in the context of the full record um, to then take forward in advance if they feel that's suitable. So just a little bit about how we actually develop these um, 
criteria. You know, we look in the literature for screening or diagnostic criteria. We then create these um, using internal tools, develop an algorithm, and then we kind of modify those. And that's where there's quite a lot of both clinical um, interpretation of how we how we translate those. It's almost like translating a like a like a, a novel from one language to the other. There are there are direct translations, but also there's an interpretation element. Um, and we can kind of restrict it to certain age brackets. We can add sex limitations and, and other limitations to it. Um, and then this is an approach, and then we, we review this internally before applying the algorithm. So we actually have a have a pilot happening um, just north of London. Um, we have a population of um, just over half a million that we have access to the data to. And we're currently returning reports in a subpopulation of just under 80,000 patients. Um, so we have criteria for about 70 diseases, um, and that includes Bechet's disease, but a range of other ones, some metabolic diseases, some of the lifestyle storage disorders, diseases like our captain neuro neurodevelopmental, including some um, chromosomal abnormalities, um, and uh, also some of the things like the ciliopathies, um, musculoskeletal disorders like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, and, and, and a range of other diseases as well. So um, if we just kind of move on to Bechet's, obviously this, uh, with the, the audience I'm sure are most interested in. Um, so there is already, as I'm sure that many people on this call are familiar with, the international criteria for diagnosing Bechet's disease uh, with a scoring system. Um, and what we, have, what we have done with this is we've taken each of those terms and we have digitalized those signs and symptoms. Now, uh, as I said before, um, as we digitalize those, there are uh, direct synonyms. So, you know, genital apt aptosis, um, there are codes specifically for that. And then for, and then for the synonyms for it. So uh, genital ulcers and things like that. We also, and this is where the interpretation comes in, sometimes incorporate additional terms under which that a certain diagnosis might sit. So that might be a, a kind of a one step up or possibly a diagnosis that may be incorrect, but that would capture that. And then also sometimes we include some misdiagnostic terms. So if we're talking about the kind of ocular lesion seen in uh, best shapes with the uveitis, um, one of the things which we look at is thinking, well, how may that be misdiagnosed? Might that be diagnosed as conjunctivitis? Um, and then we consider whether we should include that. And we, and we do that by looking both at the number of patients this would flag, whether this makes sense, um, and biological sense or kind of misdiagnosis sense, but also we look at already existing cases that we have access to this um, pseudonymized data for. So this is a just this is not an actual case, but this gives you an idea. So um, we have a, quite a number of cases who already have a diagnosis. Um, and let's say this patient was diagnosed as it can as you can see on the far right of the um, of the image, diagnosed at just under the age of thirty four. Um, and they have a whole range of different events that have happened. But in their electronic health record, you know, they may have seen their doctor with mouth ulcers, and that was coded on two occasions in acute conjunctivitis. Um, uh, skin disorder, again, this is where the interpretation acne vulgaris, I appreciate isn't um, the um, papular pustular lesions truly of um, Bechet's disease, but, but this is where a degree of interpretation can come in. And then if we include those, and the algorithm for this individual was breached five years before they actually achieved their diagnosis. As I say, this is not an actual case. This is a, an example just to kind of demonstrate the point. So I'll just talk a little bit more about some of the data from this population. So just to reiterate, we're returning reports in 80,000, but we have a pilot in half a million. So within the 500,000 population, we actually, there are 51 patients with a Bechet's diagnosis, which, um, Obviously, the prevalence is quite variable, dependent upon both demographic and ethnic regions, but it's quite significantly higher than expected. Um, you know, obviously, that would be about 10 cases per 100,000. Um, of these 51 diagnosed cases, Mendel scan actually, if, we, if that had been applied for those people, um, 14 of the 51 diagnosed patients could have been flagged earlier, so about 27%. Um, there are obviously reasons why we weren't able to pick up all 51, 
Um, and but you know that's quite a longer discussion. So for the orders of time, we'll move on. But the number of years that the patients are flagged earlier range from one to nine years, with a mean of three point five seven years, which actually equates to a total year saved across those fourteen patients of fifty years. Um, so then I guess the next question is, so, so you know, that kind of gives us an idea that actually we can utilize in the retrospective cases, identify a, a reasonable proportion of the patients who otherwise would have had a longer time before they achieved their diagnosis. Um, the next question is the total number of flag cases in the population. How, how many does our criteria flag? Because obviously you'd be able to pick everybody with Bechet's disease if you flag every single mem patient with 500,000. Um, but obviously that would never be a, Approach. So actually the criteria in that 500,000 flags 178 patients, of which 14 are diagnosed. So that's a kind of computer output, but actually we have an internal review process where um, there's a two-stage clinical review where we look at those reports and we, and we, we, we fine tune that. And ask me, a lot of the input from that is being fed back into the performance of our algorithm. Uh, but approximately 50% of that of the cases based on a subset that we've actually reviewed, um, we seem to exclude. So actual fact, how many are returning? So actually for that population of half a million, we'd be returning about 82 cases um, for with us with a with a report saying this patient may have Bechet's disease. So obviously across and this is done across a range of different rare diseases. So actual fact, this is a, probably the key thing with Mendel scan is it, it becomes actually meaningful for each individual practice because they are actually recognizing patients in their practice. It may not be for Bechet's disease, but obviously some practices may identify Bechet's patients, but, it, but rather than just going through a process where they don't see any positive from this, they're engaged because actual fact, hang on, this makes sense for this patient of mine. The final piece of work I'm just going to touch on, and this is ongoing, is we, we have had a look at the primary care health utilization of these patients. So we've looked at the 14 patients who are subsequently diagnosed, and we've looked at their health utilization. Um, so investigations, referrals, attendances in the GP practice. And we've kind of looked at those and thought, well, which ones could, had that patient been diagnosed earlier, which could have been avoided? Um, and through this process, we've come to the conclusion that there an earlier diagnosis than those 14 patients could lead to a reduction in primary care health utilization of about 876 pounds on average. Um, now, obviously, some of those costs will be transferred to secondary care because they'll then be under specialist centers and things. Uh, and indeed, we are doing exploration of linked secondary care data. But certainly from a primary care point of view, you know, there's, there's a tangible improvement, not just on health outcomes, which obviously are the most important, but poten potentially also on health economic outcomes. So in conclusion, um, I feel primary care has an important role in rare disease diagnosis, um, emphasizing the message that individually rare but collectively common, and that gut feeling and following hunches, uh, and using those digital aids to both support those inquiries um, is, a, is a thing that should be promoted in, in primary care, but also across secondary care and um, the, the whole range of health systems. But also those digital tools can be used to proactively suggest diagnoses. I think the data we've got so far with Mendel scan and Bechet's disease suggests this can work. Um, and with what probably is reasonably acceptable sensitivity and specificity. Um, obviously, we won't really know that fully until we have done this prospectively for a period of time in a large number of patients. But also the Mendel scan data also suggests that primary care data can be examined to calculate the health utilization cost including the cost of um, delayed diagnosis. Thank you. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, now I'll have a, I'll try and get, uh, ask a couple of questions. Unfortunately, because I logged off at lunch, I had to do a test. I've lost most of the questions. <laughs> that's typical, isn't it? Um, but I've got a, uh, a couple I can see here. Um, one from Karen Clarkson. Having year, years of being misdiagnosed makes me wonder whether Betchett's is truly rare or is it a lack of knowledge in the clinical sector? What measures are being put in place to ensure that rare diseases are highlighted to those first points of contact that we, the patients, see? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, this is a, a, an area that I've been um, thinking about for a, a, a long time, you know, and that kind of, I think the messaging that I've included in that, you know, the emphasizing of um, collective, individually rare, but collectively common is very important. Sometimes individual patient groups come and ask me, you know, what can we do to educate primary care about our disease with an instance of, you know, one in 200,000? And, and there is bits of me which basically say, unfortunately, driving a message for an ultra, ultra, ultra rare disease, which an individual doctor will probably never see in their career, may actually be counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve, where the messaging is, you know, you, you come up with this, mm, that's interesting, absolutely, I'd want to be able to flag this up but there are 7,000 other rare diseases and I'm unlikely to see that disease. So emphasizing that, you know, actually fact, the, the concept of gut feeling, this concept of does it look plausible um, and then encouraging people to utilizing resources that are available, whether those digital ones or whether that be linking into, you know, relevant specialists um, in the hospital. Uh, you know, and I, and I think there's, a, there's, there's quite a few opportunities. Certainly the ways of working are changing. Um, and, you know, I think I'm sure this will probably be touched on later, but, some of the aspects from the way work has happened with COVID-19, you know, there's, 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 there's a much clearer need to sometimes be less siloed in the way that we work and have better communication across different specialists and primary and secondary and tertiary care. And that's interesting. Uh, Nan Higginbottom has asked a question. When data is already collected in a specific condition like Bechet's on a large scale by clinical lead, is there any scope in the big uh, in the beginning to collect data locally from a patient perspective, such as one small area of the UK? How do patients stand in beginning this? Um, so, so this would be as in someone who would wish to look into in an individual geographical area, all the patients with Bechet's and collecting patient reported disease information. Yes, I um, presume that's what it means. Um, I mean, yeah, obviously, there's quite a lot. Of, there are quite a lot of um, issues with regards to how people collect data, how it's stored, uh, and how it's shared. Um, I think one of the things which is undoubtedly an opportunity is, you know, and I think this has been touched on some of the comments in the in the question and answers earlier on is how how we record information in, in a way that is searchable. Um, and this coding is really important and, and it is improving and also the the languages that are used are changing so um you know so this snowmed ct which is now standardized in primary care and is being widely adopted in secondary care means what we're talking about there in primary care where often we come up in our data search and come up to a bit of a bit of a oh if only we knew what then happened after this referral because it's not there in the primary care record that we can see when the when these that information is linked better we would be able to see that we would be able to see that they'd had this test done in secondary care because that record would be linked because it would be speaking the same language um i think from a patient point of view absolutely you know i think registries and i know you had a session earlier on the ability for patient reported outcomes to be incorporated into registries in neiman pictures we have one uh, and there are, it works as a you know there is both clinician inputted data but also patient and the two are linked Brilliant, thank you. Now, is Rudy around? Rudy, do you want to just say hello? We heard you in your film. You're on you're, you're mute yourself. Well done. Um, just give us some of your thoughts. We've only got a couple of minutes left uh, on where you see this going. Uh, I do know you're keen to get involved with the Centres of Excellence, with the clinical directors, to gain that additional background evidence that uh, Will was talking about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think Will did a great job at, at discussing where, where we are, but but I think, uh, you know, I, I wanna I wanna give a, a touch of, of optimism to 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 all of it. I think it's very encouraging the kind of results that we're getting today, and as you know, medicine and healthcare is getting more and more digital. These kind of system, we, we we really need to have them as much. And so, you know, we are doing this, and we're doing this for rare diseases, but we see that there's a lot of activity as well, you know, in other countries and even electronic medical providers are now starting to, you know, take notice and, and try to think about how to implement the system at scale. And I think this is really the, the, the key word for us in the rare disease field is at scale. You know, today we're doing this, as, as Will mentioned, on a small uh, scale pilot, it's a 50,000 patients, and then we're growing this to about half a million. 
but we just need, I think, to, to be able to show that this can work on 10 million, 20 million, 30 million patients. And this is really the haystack that we're, that we're looking for to, to start finding the needles. But overall, it's been, it's been very encouraging. And, and you know, the, the results that we're having with, with Bichette's, for which we had a particular focus, um, has, has been very encouraging, I would say, especially on the health economic side, because it's, it's all great, of course, to, to work for the, for the patient outcomes and everyone is, is behind us for this. But when you're in front of a commissioner and when you're in front of the NHS and they ask, you know, they, they, they ask us how much uh, we're going to save to the system or, or is, is this cost effective? Um, these are usually the, the hurdle, hurdles that are hard to, to get by. But um, no, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been good. And, and I hope that we can you know, scale this as, as soon as possible. That's fantastic. Well, as the members won't know, I met you a year or a bit ago at the RSM at these, these uh, medicine yep. events, and that's what's triggered me down this line of thought. So thank you so much. Thanks for having uh, us. Well, thank that's you. been absolutely brilliant. Um, I would have just mentioned that, in fact, Diva it will probably comment in the Q&A period uh, about uh, what's called a thin database, which is all part of the Priyanka study. So, so that will also line up with that. Brilliant. Okay, so the next